Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh and a very good good morning and salam Ramadan. Welcome to our first session of webinar series Captain of Industry brought to you by Faculty of Engineering University Technology Malaysia. We are initiating university industry collaboration during MCO to have a platform with our Captain of Industry to share their thoughts, way forward and challenges during post COVID-19. Now we are streaming live from FB Faculty of Engineering. Today we would like to welcome Mr. Samsudin bin Muhammad Yusuf, Chief Executive Officer, Composites Technology Research Malaysia, with his topic today, Pandemic COVID-19, the post challenge in manufacturing industry, future ready graduates, the role of industry. Without further ado, I would like to invite yang berusaha Professor Datuk Engineer Dr. Muhammad Rafiq Haji. Dr. Abdul Kadir, Dean, Faculty of Engineering, to introduce our captain today. Over to you, Dr. Thank you, Muruni. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning to our speaker, uh, Mr. Shamsuddin Muhammad Yusuf. Uh, and also a very good morning to all of you watching this Captain of Industry webinar live through our Faculty of Engineering Facebook. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you so much to our presenter today despite his busy schedule, can still slot an hour with us to share his experience leading CTRM and be appointed as our captain of industry. Let me uh, give a brief introduction, a short biography of our uh, presenter today. Uh, Mr. Shamsuddin Muhammad Yusuf is the Chief Executive Officer uh, for Composites Technology Research Malaysia Sendirian Berhad, CTRM. Uh, he has been in manufacturing industry for almost 30 years serving several multinational companies, namely JVC Electronics Malaysia, Sundarian Berhad, Western Digital Malaysia, Sundarian Berhad, and conglomerate DRB Highcom Malaysia, Sundarian Berhad. And uh, uh, he has been appointed as a member of Aerospace Malaysia Innovation Center, AMIC Board, Malaysian Aerospace Council, and AI Exchange CEO at Faculty Program 1.0, Learn from the Pros, by the Ministry of Education, Malaysia. So without further ado, uh, I call upon Mr. Shamsuddin Muhammad Yusuf. Over to you, Mr. Shamsuddin. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Uh, yang berbahagia Datuk Profesor Dr. Muhammad Rafiq, uh, Datuk Bikadeh. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your introduction. Uh, on behalf of uh, CTRM and of course uh, myself, uh, first and foremost, uh, we would like to thank uh, UTM for inviting me uh, for this session uh, to enable me to share uh, some of the things that what we are doing in the aerospace industry, particularly uh, CTRM, uh, which involves uh, on composites. And of course, uh, I would also like to take this opportunity uh, to say Salam Ramadan uh, to all uh, the lecturers uh, of UTM. Uh, just for your information, I was the former uh, graduates of uh, UTM in 1988, uh, pursuing uh, in electronic and electrical courses. Uh, and of course, uh, today, I think uh, I would like also to take this opportunity to thank my team, uh, because in order to allow us to have uh, this session in a more focused and aligned uh, environment, uh, so allow me to share with you some of the slides that we have prepared uh, today. So uh, since uh, it will take us through uh, allow, uh, about 20 to 30 minutes uh, to complete this uh, session, I think I have about approximately also around 20 slides. There are certain slides uh, of the page that I may, may go through uh, a bit faster in the essence of time, and but there are certain things that especially on the two main topics that we will talk about today, which is on the pandemic COVID-19, uh, the post challenge in manufacturing industry, as well as the future ready graduates and the role of the industry and academics uh, that I will try to take a bit of my time, uh, a bit of time uh, to explain. So the presentation today will cover uh, several areas. The first, allow me to uh, share with you about the career of my, the journey of my career uh, throughout these 30 years. And secondly, uh, allow me to also introduce uh, our company, Composite Technology Research Malaysia. Uh, we have prepared a profile uh, for your consumption, as well as uh, the two topics that I mentioned uh, earlier. 
So basically, I think throughout 30 years of my experience, uh, uh, I think uh, I spent 14 years uh, in the first 14 years uh, with electronics uh, industry. Uh, I have served uh, two multinational company uh, that is uh, JVC Electronics Malaysia Sunda Mahat in Shah Alam. And uh, after 11 years, uh, I moved uh, in, uh, into uh, what you call this hard disk drive uh, technology, the IT based industry, which is called Western Digital for almost two years. And before joining a uh, local company, uh, CS Metal Industry, uh, which is situated in uh, Klang uh, for about uh, four plus years. So entirely, uh, I spent about 14 plus years uh, with electronic industry covering the downstream and upstream uh, process. When I said uh, downstream, I'm referring on the components, uh, manufacturing industry covering uh, metal stamping, injection molding, painting, and so on. While in JVC and Western Digital is more on the consumer electronics. Uh, JVC is involved with audio uh, products, uh, manufacturing, uh, encompassing radio cassette, MIDI hi-fi, uh, as well as uh, other audio system. Uh, while WD is on the hard disk drive uh, technology. So after that, uh, after completing the first 14 years, I moved uh, into automotive in 2004. Uh, where I started uh, again my career in PHN Industry Malaysia Sinam Rahat is also another metal stamping company uh, which involved with uh, automotive. Uh, we produce car uh, in lights of Proton, uh, Produa, as well as uh, Honda, uh, Suzuki and the rest. We also uh, uh, in PHN, uh, most of the parts uh, that we produce is metal stamping base uh, for uh, for uh, body frames of car. And before I was appointed as uh, the, the CEO uh, in 2009 uh, to head uh, the Oriental Sum industry. So this is uh, the first job that I been appointed as the head of company. Uh, so I begin my career as a head of company in OSI, which also another stamping company. But uh, the difference between PHI and OSI, OSI is involved with the undercarriage uh, metal stamping parts uh, where involve a lot of safety related parts like for example axial parts so as you jack up your car uh, uh, to see the underneath of the car so all the metal the big metal parts is produced by OSI while PHN is more on the body parts like the door uh, and as well as the hood trunk lid uh, frames and whatnot and also as well as the floor parts so after that uh, in after finish uh, my uh, serving uh, OSI in until 2013, uh, then I moved uh, into uh, high conductor casting for six months, which uh, casting involved with the manufacturing of uh, uh, what you call this engine components. So it is made of casting. So it is slightly different from the previous two, uh, which the two patient OSI, they use uh, metal stamping, but in, 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 in casting, we use molds. And, and, and molds uh, to actually uh, to fabricate the parts. And after that, uh, in 2000, after six months in 2013, then I move on into car assembly uh, production in Pekan. Uh, so this is where uh, I had the opportunity uh, because of the uh, joint venture project between the RB and Volkswagen, uh, because the early setup, uh, they require someone uh, to manage this. So I was uh, tasked again uh, to head uh, the VW operation as well as the Mercedes uh, plant operation in Pekan uh, for three plus years. And during that time, I think the first one year also, I have Suzuki with me. So I have three uh, generally uh, brands uh, with me that uh, I have to manage uh, under that operation in Pekan. And in 2016, uh, uh, somewhere around February, uh, then uh, when DRV Highcom after the acquisition of uh, CTRM in November 2013, then again, I was given the opportunity uh, to hit uh, this CTRM. So this is where I am today. So I would like to talk about, uh, before I touch about CTRM, so allow me uh, to brief you all about the Malaysian aerospace industry that we are in, because uh, the government of Malaysia has identified uh, that the aerospace industry as a strategic industry uh, in 1990, way about 20 uh, plus years ago. And the aerospace industry today uh, is able to generate about 12.7 uh, 12 billion. 
and uh, it employs uh, more than 21,000 skilled workforce today. Uh, so basically, uh, in somewhere around 2015, uh, the second blueprint was established uh, by uh, the Malaysia uh, by and launched by our Prime Minister. Okay, uh, established by METI and launched by our Prime Minister in Lima in 2015 where the aim is for this Malaysia Aerospace Industry Group in 2030 is to position Malaysia as the number one aerospace nation in Southeast Asian region, as well as uh, hopefully by the year 2030, uh, the annual revenue is expected to grow by 55.2 billion. And of course, uh, more than that, it is aimed uh, to be able to generate about 32,000 high income jobs. So let's uh, go back a bit uh, about the RB Highcom uh, because by virtue CTRM uh, is the subsidiary of the RB Highcom. So I would like to explain our parent company. So the RB Highcom is involved in three main uh, sectors that is automotive, service and education, as well as property. So the RB Highcom uh, basically is incorporated in 28 August 1990 and uh, has been listed in Malaysia Bursa uh, in 4th September 1992 with the market capitalization of uh, RM 3.7 billion. Uh, currently, the operating revenue as at 31st March 2019 uh, is around 12.5 billion, and with a total asset of uh, 42.7 billion ringgit. And currently, uh, DRB has more than uh, 55,000 uh, workforce. So, uh, for CTRM, by which we are uh, involved with the manufacturing activities uh, for specific product that is composite. So currently, uh, under the RB Highcom reporting structure, uh, we are actually being placed under the RB Highcom Automotive Distribution, Defense and Manufacturing and Engineering Division, which uh, I am currently, as a CEO of uh, CTRM, is reporting directly uh, to the Chief of Operating Officer, Corporate and Services, that is Datuk Jazli Muhammad Ramli. And uh, he is uh, as well as reporting to the Group Managing Director, which is Datuk Sri Sat Fazal Alba. So, for CTRM, basically, uh, we have, as I mentioned, we have been incorporated on 20th November 1990 uh, with Ministry of Finance Incorporated as its uh, principal shareholders, where our strategic role is to develop the high technology based industry, namely the aerospace as well as the composites. And of course, our primary objective and obligation is clearly to take the lead in the developing of the advanced composite industry in Malaysia by developing people, capability as well as products. So the DRB Hakong acquired uh, CTRM uh, from the Ministry of Finance in last November 2013. Of course, uh, our main business focus is mainly uh, in aerospace and composite manufacturing. And currently, uh, our land area size is about 58 acres across uh, the six entire big buildings. And we are residing uh, nearby to the airport, Batu Berendam, just beside the runaway. And currently, our build-up area out of the six buildings is nearly 1 million square foot. And of course, uh, we employ uh, more than 2,700 uh, employees as at 31st January 2020. So let me tell you a little bit about composite. Why uh, this is, uh, what is it all about about composite? Because a lot of people didn't really know and understand uh, what is composite about. So composite uh, basically uh, to serve as an alternative solution uh, to metal. And of course, uh, due, it, due to its characteristic, composite is extremely strong and lighter, uh, more than uh, metal. And of course, uh, by us uh, using this composite into the structure of aircraft, it will help the aircraft to become more lighter. This will be able to contribute in terms of uh, reducing the aircraft uh, fuel consumption, so as well as the emission. So as you can see underneath uh, the photo, uh, under the Y, uh, the weight reduction, if you compare one to one with any products that probably we will be developing by using composite, it is uh, estimated that uh, we can have the weight reduction around 20 to five uh, to 50%. Uh, 
But of course, uh, in terms of cost-wise, uh, we will find the one-to-one -one pricing uh, in terms of composite, uh, it will be slightly higher. But uh, for members, uh, uh, actually interest, uh, so we would, uh, I would like to explain that when you fly an aircraft, uh, usually 50% uh, of the cost is contributed uh, by fuel consumption. So it is uh, very important uh, for us to ensure that, you know, uh, we should try our best uh, to design and to build the aircraft as lighter as possible. So with this, uh, it will help to reduce the operating costs. So under the 45 years of composite evolution in aircraft, uh, basically we can see that the application of composite uh, in the aircraft uh, has been actually very positive. Uh, we can see the new generation of aircraft uh, since 2005 which started with A380. If you can see the 2005 A380, what we call a super jumbo, double-decker aircraft, uh, which uh, Malaysian Airlines also have a few of it. But of course, uh, I think uh, due to its uh, performance, it, it is not really that economical, economical where it demands a high level of occupancy rate uh, because this aircraft can house uh, more than 500 people uh, on board. So, some, so due to this, I think, uh, and also uh, I think the one that uh, also owns a lot of this type of aircraft, A380, is Emirates Airlines. So uh, we have been receiving the notice uh, to cease uh, this, uh, uh, the aircraft uh, by Airbus. Uh, Airbus will cease its operation somewhere around next year, A380. So... So, but you can see that the content of the composite uh, when they design the A30 is almost reaching to 30%, but they are somewhere around 2014 and 15, you can see there are three type of aircraft that already achieving almost near to 50% region in terms of uh, composite content. Uh, so that is the B787, uh, Boeing 787 and A350 or Airbus 350. So both of these uh, aircraft is what we call as a twin aisle aircraft uh, beside uh, the C series, or normally we call it a small regional jet. In terms of core business and global customer footprint, uh, actually, uh, CTRM, uh, we have three subsidiaries. The main one is CTRM Aero Composite, uh, which contribute around 99% of our revenue today. And of course, uh, we also did uh, some. Uh, development of new product under the CTRM Composite Engineering. Uh, we are currently working on the satellite communication products. Uh, we also uh, in the process of developing, I think for the past two years on the aircraft seats, where you know that a lot of this metal frame has been used as a structure on the seats. We are proposing uh, some of the metal structure to be changed into composite as to make the aircraft lighter because just imagine in one A320 aircraft like the ones that have been used uh, many by A Asia, uh, you can imagine that in one aircraft uh, we have about more than between 180 to 220 seats. So if you can mount or can change uh, some of the metal structure of the seats into composites, uh, apart from making it lighter, you can imagine the amount of revenue that can be generated uh, from this uh, exercise. And the third one is uh, CTRM testing laboratory. Uh, so in order to make uh, CTRM as a one-stop business center, so we, uh, we have our own testing laboratory, not only to serve uh, our internal uh, needs, but also as well as to serve the external need like in the, the oil and gas industry, as well as uh, construction and et cetera. And of course, uh, CTRM Group uh, current revenue is almost uh, reaching 1 billion. I think our best record uh, we uh, in 2018-19, uh, we have touched uh, 953.2. But subsequently in 2019, uh, because by virtue of our business cal calendar has been changed from normally April to March uh, into January to December. So last year, we only record about nine months. Uh, so with uh, 731.48 million. So how uh, we started uh, basically, I think uh, before I mention anything, I would like to thank 
uh, the previous government in the early days for such uh, for having such a, ve a visionary plan. Uh, I think in 1990, uh, that is where the MOF started the business. Uh, but of course, uh, this is mainly to explore something that Malaysian government planned to explore, a new territory. So that is where in 1993, CTRM has sent a total of 35 Malaysian technical interns uh, to Eagle Australia in Perth uh, to learn and explore the skill of manufacturing of the lightweight composite aircraft Eagle 150B or the two-seaters or four-seaters aircraft. So during this uh, time in Perth, uh, the team uh, from Malaysia has managed uh, to manufacture and assemble about 44 sets of Eagle uh, 150B aircraft. So that is how uh, we started to learn. But subsequently, in 1996, uh, another team was also been formed and been sent to US. That is where uh, also we uh, started to learn about another aircraft called Lens Air in US. Uh, and apart from learning the manufacturing and assembly of that aircraft, we are also having the opportunity to expose about the new technology of material, what we call as pre prepreg material. So I will explain later about this pre prepreg material technology. And with that uh, uh, experience and knowledge that has been equipped, uh, what uh, and coupled with the pre prepreg material technology that we have managed uh, to, to learn from Lens Air. And that is where CTRM start uh, because uh, the early days why we did not continue uh, with the aircraft manufacturing and assembly. In view of the limited market that we have in Malaysia, I think the government have decided to transform uh, the company into components manufacturing. So this is where actually CTRM begin uh, to start uh, our bid on the Airbus A300 commercial aircraft component what we call as a fixed trailing edge uh, that we managed and su su successfully completed it and to deliver to our customer. So with that, uh, actually somewhere around year 2000, if you can see uh, there's a, a remark underneath the year 2000, the Airbus A300, the first aerostructure program that we have successfully delivered in terms of quality, in terms of fulfilling the timing as well as the cost that has been able to serve as a turning point uh, to enable CTRM to capture more and more business over the years. And of course, uh, today uh, we uh, are proud to say that we have uh, today, uh, we have made present uh, to almost all the aircraft uh, that uh, been built uh, either by Airbus and Boeing because uh, currently uh, this industry is uh, actually, we have the duopoly uh, coming from Airbus and Boeing and we have completed entirely about 22 programs uh, with 13 aircraft model and of course one helicopter model with us uh, that we did, uh, that we we manufacture for a bus uh, which involve across uh, five OEMs so why, when i say OEMs so Airbus Boeing we have uh, in the likes of uh, Embraer uh, Mitsubishi uh, and the rest so these are the so called OEMs So these are some of the components that uh, CTRM built, just to give you a better idea. Uh, I think uh, on the A320, which uh, A-Asia, I think Tony Fernandez order a lot. So uh, I think uh, we have uh, A320, we have uh, chocolate aileron, as well as mover fairing, and as well as spoilers. So those are the key parts that we produce for the single aisle. Uh, and then for the twin R for A350, uh, we, we also build uh, some component, what we call as France Spa, Fan Cow, uh, Nose Cap, as well as J Nose. And uh, for the A400M, uh, uh, I think the one, this is the one that uh, involved uh, with military uh, aircraft, uh, which uh, Malaysian, uh, uh, our, our country bought about four uh, aircraft sets uh, from Airbus. We also build quite a number of parts uh, for this. We have vertical tailplane, as well as uh, horizontal, as well as the, the fairings uh, of this. So, so these are some of the parts that we built uh, for A400M. And, and the other one is on the B787, or what we call as Dreamliner. We also have uh, about three parts that we built for Boeing. 
uh, that is the aft casket, as well as the fan cow and also the inner barrel outer skin or eyeballs. And for and for the helicopter uh, H one three O for Airbus, we also build uh, the most complex part, what we call as Fenestron. So in order for us to build uh, the composite uh, panels and products, uh, surely uh, we need all this uh, capital equipment or what we call as uh, key equipments. So uh, of course uh, our Pre-packed material uh, actually require minus 18 degrees C uh, to be preserved. So all across our building, we have about seven uh, freezers uh, to store this equipment. So where, where we got this uh, equipment from, uh, all the equipment is coming all the way from UK. Uh, is, this is what we call as uh, uh, the advanced uh, composite uh, pre-packed material. So after we have uh, defrost uh, the material, or we do the towing process. So then the material will be sent to all the seven ply cutters. And these seven ply cutters that we have uh, today is able to cut uh, almost uh, nearly 500 to 600,000 uh, uh, various shapes uh, of panel uh, per month. Uh, so uh, this is what we call uh, high-tech equipments where uh, most of it will use uh, software for us to program on the shapes uh, of the panels to be cut uh, based on customer drawing that has been uh, given to us. And of course, uh, by using this uh, high-tech equipment or cutting machine, and uh, th this is where uh, the metal will be cut into uh, with the operation of two shifts uh, throughout uh, seven days a week. And then after we have completed uh, cutting this uh, composite material, which is come uh, from the roll form, we then send uh, to the layup rooms uh, where we will do the hand layout process uh, where the composite will be uh, actually uh, laid one piece by piece uh, depending on the thickness specification by the drawing as defined by customer. Some we have to lay more than 50 to 50 layers, 4 to 50 layers. So it is important during this uh, process, we ensure that there is no air entrapment in between uh, the layers. So uh, this is uh, been done uh, uh, by almost uh, 650 workforce that we have okay, uh, uh, throughout the factory. And then after we have completed uh, this process, uh, then we will send to Autoclave. So I think uh, we are about to approach uh, Raya. So if you all can imagine that how we bake a cake, that will be very simple. You know? uh, so after that, we will bake. Uh, the composite, uh, we send the mold in together with the composites uh, panels that we have been able to shape according to the molds and we will apply 180 degrees Celsius uh, temperature with 5 uh, to 8 bar pressure. So uh, based uh, on the curing cycle, some will take about between 8 to 18 hours depending on the curing recipe. So after that, uh, the, the material will be taken out and that is where later we will send to another uh, CNC machines where all the panels will be cut uh, by this uh, high-tech equipment, uh, what we call Kronos, uh, in accordance to the shape and spec that has been defined by drawing. And uh, after that, uh, it will go through the non-destructive testing machine or, or simply as a layman, we can say that this is an X-ray machine to ensure that all the, every single panel will be scanned and X-ray to ensure that uh, there is no uh, bubble in between the layers. That means no air entrapment as well as there is no FOD or foreign uh, object or foreign material in between the layers. And then before later, once this is has been passed, it will then send uh, those uh, panel that which is required to be sprayed. It will then uh, be sent uh, to the spray booth. So now I will talk about uh, our today's subject. Uh, that is uh, basically uh, the pandemic COVID-19 post challenge in manufacturing industry. So, so the first two pages of uh, today uh, will cover about the pre-COVID. It is important for me to share with you about uh, what is the potential of the aerospace industry uh, prior to this uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreak. So as 
this is some of the data that uh, we actually gathered from Airbus uh, global manufacturing forecast uh, uh, previously. So according to this uh, report, uh, the world aircraft uh, demand pro projection is expected uh, to reach about uh, 37,400 aircraft units that we need to build uh, within the next uh, basically 20 years. That is uh, from 2018 until 2030. So this is uh, what has been projected. So we will, uh, so this statistic or this data uh, is just to tell everyone that we can imagine that uh, I've been in the past three industry and today I am in the aerospace sector. Among the sector that I have involved, uh, this is uh, supposedly to be uh, the most promising uh, uh, sector that will that can offer a continuous growth. Uh, okay, uh, this is based on the last forty-five years data that we can see that without fail, uh, and at every fifteen years uh, throughout the forty-five years, that means the three cycle that the growth has been doubled. So that based on that data, uh, actually we can see that uh, currently uh, the total aircraft is about twenty thousand four hundred fifty. But as we move forward into 2037, uh, we can expect that the requirement of the new aircraft based on the passenger traveling will increase uh, to 26,540. So that is uh, to cater the gross market. While uh, 10,850 is expected uh, to replace the old aging aircraft because for those, those aircraft has, has reached more than 20 years old, uh, that is uh, definitely uh, due to be replaced uh, because in order to ensure that the safety standards is always uh, not been compromised. While the 10,600 uh, is basically, uh, uh, that is, uh, will remain uh, as uh, the current, uh, for the current aircraft. So entirely from this data, we can see that uh, the requirement of the new aircraft to be built in the next 20 years is around 30, 37,000. 37,390 aircraft. And of course, uh, the small segment, uh, if you can refer to the notes on your left, uh, is actually represent around 76%. So when we say about the small segment, similar like our shirt, we have S size, we have M size, L size, and XL size. So for the S and M, it's basically representing the single aisle. So the one that uh, the most famous aircraft that we have today, uh, what we call as the volume driver, is actually uh, on the S size, which is currently is around twenty eight thousand five hundred fifty from the from the total projection of thirty seven thousand four hundred, which which is this is the one uh, currently is A Asia has been buying a lot, as well as others low cost carrier, while the M size or probably the twin aisle is around fifteen percent. Uh, okay, and the rest uh, basically. Uh, uh, so, of course, uh, it is also expected that the Asia Pacific uh, region, knowing that uh, Asia Pacific uh, moving forward uh, is expect the, the traveling is expected expected to grow by almost forty two percent, and of course uh, we are expecting more and more aircraft uh, would be purchased by the many airliners, uh, noting that. Uh, this Asia Pacific region is one of the area uh, that will be buying more aircraft. Uh, of course, uh, the emerging country uh, like India, like Indonesia, as well as uh, China at this moment. Of course, uh, China, as you all know, is also in the midst of uh, building their own aircraft, what we call as COMEC 919929. But by virtue, by, 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 by virtue this will take more time, uh, maybe probably 8 to 10 years from now, so they are currently still depending on Airbus and Boeing uh, to supply the new aircraft uh, to them. So in terms of the industry outlook, uh, actually the aviation industry or the aerospace industry, uh, just before the pre-COVID, uh, we assume it is a really a robust industry. It has gone through uh, many crises before, from 1977 until uh, today. Uh, it has gone through the oil crisis, financial crisis, the 9-11, uh, SARS outbreak, and so on. So you can refer to the chart, you can see. But as I mentioned earlier, 
uh, throughout every 15 years for the past 45 years without fail. This industry has demonstrated a significant, a significant growth. However, I think uh, when we start uh, to gather more data last year, towards the end of the last year uh, from IATA, IATA is the International Air Transport uh, Association. So, so from the statistic that we have gathered last year, uh, we noticed that the overall uh, traveling and air cargo volume growth has been declining uh, at a slow pace. So we can see that from 2017, 2018 and 2019, while the blue color is represent, representing uh, the air travel or RPK, what we call as revenue passenger per kilometer growth, and the other one FTK is actually representing for the cargo or the freight uh, uh, business. So both uh, actually actually as indicate, indicated some slowdown uh, prior to this uh, COVID-19 outbreak. So what will happen uh, after this uh, COVID-19? So we did also gather more data uh, from the various sources, international sources, and based on this study, uh, of course, uh, we compared to the previous uh, uh, epidemic or pandemic that uh, the world has experienced, for example, like SARS, as well as the financial crisis, as I mentioned earlier. And, and when we compare the COVID-19, we have two uh, segments here. We compare COVID-19 that has been actually experienced by China, where they took, uh, actually you refer to the red colored graph, uh, almost only six months uh, to recover. And of course, uh, as of today, since uh, the outbreak uh, commenced in China somewhere around December or early January, I think as far as China is concerned, as of today, uh, they have uh, managed to revive uh, their domestic uh, economic activity, including their domestic air travel, uh, currently which has almost reaching around between 40 to 50 percent at this moment. This is based on what Airbus has uh, informed us. And of course, uh, unfortunately, since this is what COVID-19 has now uh, almost infected more than 200 countries all over the world. So it has been actually recognized by WHO as the pandemic that what uh, actually the world community has to uh, face today. So with this, I think uh, we foresee it will take quite some time uh, to enable for the US side and Europe uh, to recover. I think uh, as at this morning, I think based on the latest statistic, what we have experienced and based on the report uh, that we received, uh, we have about close to 4.2 million uh, people has been infected uh, worldwide and uh, the death toll has reached to more than 286,000 as at this morning. So you can imagine that the how, how serious and how severe the pandemic has uh, actually affected all the country. And of course, uh, uh, this uh, will take some time definitely. And of course, the recovery will be very, very much uncertain now. So this is another data that I would like to show with you. Uh, that the source data that we gathered uh, from uh, one of our international research uh, center. So uh, among these, uh, these are all the so-called major airliners uh, that currently uh, from the 17 major airlines uh, that we have actually uh, gathered uh, in terms of the reports and statistics. Uh, for example, in Europe, uh, we have uh, around five major airlines over there. And we have uh, some in US in lights of uh, American Airlines, Delta Airlines, United Airlines. So these are all the so-called common aircraft uh, that we uh, CTRM folks used to travel because by virtue we are dealing with the global supply chain and global customers. So this job, of course, definitely requires us to travel uh, everywhere uh, around the globe. So we can see that the first column indicating the grounding of the fleet so all these major airliners uh, actually uh, currently has grounded between 50 to almost 100% of, of their aircraft. So this is how uh, severe that the epidemic, uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 has hit uh, very hard, uh, which has in a way, uh, we can say that it has crippled the entire aviation industry at this moment. Okay. And which uh, also uh, because of this uh, has led uh, to the lockdown 
by almost many many countries today in order to avoid any potential imports of uh, COVID-19 pandemic that probably can be transmitted uh, through uh, the traveling activity by the many visitors or even uh, by their own citizen. And uh, I think the effect of this actually has caused some of the major airliners uh, to actually lay off some of their workforce. We can see that almost 80% has started to initiate the layoff of their workforce. Uh, I think uh, Boeing Airbus also not, not excluded. I think uh, last week we received uh, almost a few thousands of their employee has been uh, laid off or going uh, into the process, what we call uh, furlough. And of course, uh, some of the employees also has undergo a pay cut uh, beside other things uh, that currently the company is uh, looking into on how to ensure that uh, the company can uh, survive uh, through this crisis mode. So as a result of the impact of the COVID-19 uh, to the aviation industry, as I mentioned earlier, so I think uh, the most significant one is uh, many major airlines that has today grounded the aircraft. And of course, uh, of course, the many airliners now in the talks uh, with uh, Airbus and Boeing uh, to probably defer and even cancel some of the aircraft order. So despite that, currently, as I mentioned to you, based on the earlier data, we can see that uh, actually this, this industry without the COVID-19 is so robust that all of us uh, has been working very hard uh, for the many, many years in manufacturing uh, or, or looking into manufacturing all the components for this aircraft. Because uh, before the COVID-19, the A320 backlogs uh, is actually uh, around, uh, backlog orders is around seven to eight uh, years. So you can imagine uh, the prospect and the, uh, uh, the prospect that can be offered uh, by this industry in terms of not only business, but as well as creating more employments. And, and today, uh, actually, uh, as a result of COVID-19, uh, not only we have the grounding of uh, aircraft by the major airlines, we have aircraft cancellation, but we also have this air traffic volume. Of course, uh, when every country has uh, done the lockdown where they will not allow anybody to travel. So of course, uh, we can see that the air traffic uh, volume has plummeted. And of course, uh, this has reached to a very unprecedented, un unprecedented level, okay? And of course, uh, in view of this, uh, I think uh, we have not uh, uh, having any vaccine today. And of course, uh, by virtue that uh, the industry uh, will be going through a very difficult time and the recovery will take uh, longer than what it is uh, expected. So of course, some of the company uh, may enter into bankruptcy. So this is what is uh, what we are uh, looking at. So this is, uh, at this moment, uh, I think only company organization that have uh, strong cash flow uh, will be able to uh, probably pull through this crisis. So, but uh, of course, it all depends on how soon uh, the vaccine can be uh, developed and, uh, and, and if probably in one year itself, uh, we can see that already many airliners uh, uh, will go through a lot of uh, suffering and uh, a lot of uh, uh, them will start uh, to file bankruptcy. And uh, beside that, uh, we are also looking that the escalation of unemployment rate or the furlough by most of the airliners. So we can see that those are the statistics coming from Spain, US, as well as France. Uh, the number is quite... Uh, scary because uh, this uh, what we see today is only uh, is at the preliminary stage but probably as we move along uh, after three months six months nine months to 12 months the number probably will further escalate so this is what uh, actually uh, worrying us so uh, the challenges of the manufacturing industry uh, in actually comprehending the uh, COVID-19 uh, of course uh, some of the item that uh, what uh, come across uh, my team and me uh, first is on the recovery uh, is very much uncertain at this moment as I, as I mentioned for as long as we cannot know clearly when the vaccine can be finally 
developed by the scientists and uh, a lot of people uh, is estimating around 9 to 12 months but looking at the current time probably as mentioned uh, by I think every day we heard from KKM uh, the vaccine development probably may take around one year to probably two years time so with this uh, of course uh, we can expect that the in view of the grounding of the many aircraft by the airliners and surely for company like CTRM who involve with manufacturing activities our manufacturing activities is very much uh, triggered by uh, new aircraft delivery so for this i think uh, we will be having uh, quite uh, a difficult time uh, where of course, uh, as many airliners has asked to defer or to cancel orders, so we can assume that the volume of production uh, will be reduced uh, tremendously. So as at today, uh, based on the latest forecast that we receive uh, from all our tier one's customer, our orders has reduced uh, more than 40% at this moment. So that's why uh, I think uh, we can also imagine that, uh, of course, uh, we used to be almost... Uh, our revenue uh, to be almost at 1 billion. But actually, moving forward uh, for this year, we are anticipating that the revenue uh, definitely will be impacted by nearly 400 million. And uh, on the second item is on the managing surplus of capacity. So when we've been hit hard by the reduction of orders, that means, uh, and, and you know, for any company to make entry into this uh, type of industry, this is a uh, highly capital intensive industry. You can imagine the amount of capex that we have to fork out in order to make entry into the business. For CTM today, we have more than uh, almost close to 400 million in terms of assets and equipment. Uh, so it is not easy uh, for us uh, to break even because this industry requires a long gestation period uh, for any uh, business that you start uh, to venture. So. With this excess capacity, definitely uh, will pose a great challenge to us. Of course, all our major equipments, our our, our key assets that we have uh, invested uh, will experience uh, a lot of excess capacity. Uh, so, of course, uh, on top of that, uh, we also need to be on the lookout uh, to look after all the problematic suppliers. As this goes by, uh, those suppliers that having... Uh, not able to maintain their cash flow, probably they will start uh, to get into trouble. Uh, so uh, I think they will not be able to not only pay their suppliers, but prob probably uh, also their employees. So that is why I think one of the drastic measures that has been taken by some of the airliners is to immediately lay off uh, some of the employee in order to stop uh, the bleeding. Other than that, I think, uh, as you know, that uh, this industry is the high, uh, is highly regulated industry where safety standard is paramount. So, of course, uh, uh, of course, uh, many of the uh, organization that involve or many companies that involve in this business is spending a lot, especially our tier one like Spirit Aerosystem, Collins, as well as uh, GKN and Sonaka and so on. They spend a lot on R&D, uh, research and development or even research and technological development uh, 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 investment. Uh, for the in developing the future technology. Uh, of course, the aim and focus is how to make the aircraft uh, more lighter than what it is today in order for them uh, to reduce further their operating costs. But not only that, but, but also they are looking into various ways and means on how uh, to reduce the fuel consumption of the aircraft uh, by improving the engine, engine performance and whatnot. And of course, uh, uh, because of the COVID-19, actually, uh, for this R&D, r and uh, will be affected. I think most companies will uh, stop the activity at this moment in order to preserve uh, the cash uh, money as much as possible. Other than that, uh, we also uh, uh, can see that, uh, and also we anticipated more cost down. Pressure will be coming uh, to the OEMs uh, from the airliners. So, of course, uh, many airliners would expect the price of uh, aircraft to be reduced or more cheaper. And of course, due to that, uh, Airbus and Boeing uh, will have uh, to expect that more cost down uh, coming from the airliners. And subsequently, uh, 
this will also uh, come to tier one and as well tier two like CTRM. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have we still uh, actually awaiting for the vaccine uh, that has been mentioned uh, almost every day now. Uh, but of course, uh, this is still at the clinical uh, testing stage, and 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 because of this will take uh, some time, and of course we will not know what uh, we need to do. But it's like, uh, but as but at least, uh, but of course. Uh, we need to learn how to adapt to what we call as the new normal life, where, of course, uh, every now and then we have to use our face masks in order to protect ourselves and not, and also as well as to protect our people. Uh, as mentioned by KKM, almost every day now, we need to maintain our social distancing. And, of course, we should not be getting into any uh, group gathering uh, as well as uh, the rest of the thing that, uh, of course, we have to always uh, daily wash our hands or sanitize our hands. So these are the so-called new normal thing. But what uh, the, the thing that puzzles us, if this COVID-19 pandemic uh, were to continue and we will need to continue this industry without any vaccine. So I couldn't imagine that how uh, the aircraft uh, of single aisle of 180 to 200 seaters will need to be reduced, your occupancy by half. That means you can only house about half uh, of the 200 or 180. That means you can only load about 90 to 100 passenger in order to maintain the protocol of uh, safe distancing. Because even now, uh, for locals carrier like Air Asia and so on, for them to be able to bring even probably they need to make sure that they have uh, to have almost 100 percent occupancy or maybe to the least of 90 percent. So if this were to continue, you can imagine that the impact uh, that able to be created uh, by the airliners, of course, we airliners will suffer a lot uh, if they have to restrict uh, the number of load of passengers uh, that are going to get into the aircraft. So this is uh, will be very, very impractical. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the, the last part is about maintaining the skill workforce. So, of course, uh, we have to go through this, uh, maybe probably some of our skill workforce we may lose uh, in order to ensure that uh, we need to do uh, some drastic measures uh, in ensure uh, the sustainable of the company. Now, I would like to share with you on the second part of the presentation, uh, of course, uh, about the role of the industry and academics uh, as regard to the future ready graduates. So I, I can only talk to you about what we have done uh, in CTRM. Uh, of course, uh, of course, uh, our collaboration uh, between uh, ourselves uh, as well as the academia uh, involves uh, four areas. Number one is the curriculum embedment. The second on the subject matter expert sharing. The third on the industry industrial placement as well as the strategic partnership. On the curriculum embedment, uh, we have several platforms uh, that we have kickstart. Uh, for example, uh, we have established our diploma in degree. Uh, in composite uh, with our DRP Highcom University. Uh, it took us uh, almost three years to complete uh, this exercise because noting that, you know, uh, in Malaysia, uh, there's no university yet except uh, probably KKTM, uh, which is uh, the, the small IPT that offers uh, this. But even that is only at the level of certificate as well as uh, diploma. So in order to ensure that... Uh, not only this uh, can be offered to public, uh, but also as part of uh, our company, uh, it is important for us to ensure that we create uh, the career development for our uh, our employees. So that is why we have collaborated with the uh, DRB High University University in the, in developing this diploma in degree, because uh, many of our staff, the entry level to this composite industry is technician. That means uh, either you are from SKM2 uh, or SKM3. So this is where the level of entry uh, is uh, required. Uh, but of course, uh, other than that, uh, we also uh, look into uh, those uh, other courses. But uh, if happen that they are coming from different from uh, composite, what they, they have to go, they have to go through uh, some uh, training, which later I will share with you. And uh, other than that, uh, our company also have able to uh, have been endorsed uh, by uh, 
uh, has been endorsed to develop the National Occupation, Occupational Skills Standard or NOS curriculum uh, by Ministry of Higher Education. Uh, we basically has uh, developed uh, from SKM level one until SKM level five. So, uh, of course, uh, other than that, uh, on the subject matter expert sharing, we also have our lecturer attachment program uh, with our DRBH community as well as UTEM and IPT like KKTM as, as well as IKBN. So, so we are working with them and, and the lecturer attachment program, probably those lecturers who are interested uh, to produce uh, their research papers. So normally they will be attached uh, with CTRM uh, for a number of months or probably one years uh, to, pro to prepare uh, those things. So, of course, uh, normally CTRM uh, will assist and provide our cooperation in helping them in uh, preparing those. And beside that, we also have SME attachment uh, to institute. Uh, SME stands for the subject matter expert, where some of our staff is qualified to run uh, this SKM level one and SKM level five. We deploy them to the various institutes, but at this uh, moment, we have two uh, universities that has been engaging our staff for those uh, diploma in degree that we have developed uh, for the composite curriculum. So some of our staff is actually uh, qualified uh, to run this, uh, some of the syllabus uh, for that. And in terms of industrial placement, uh, we also have uh, uh, four of them. We have CEO faculty program, uh, we also have talent exchange program. Uh, I think this is the one that uh, from UTM, uh, you, uh, we have uh, Dr. Harris uh, that has undergone this training. Uh, Dr. Harris is uh, one of the member, one of the lecturer from uh, your faculty of engineering, basically. He, he has completed a six month attachment with us, as well as we have the apprenticeship and internship program that we offer uh, outside and also for internal. So basically what we are trying uh, to explain to everyone that uh, all these uh, syllabus and curriculum that we have developed uh, jointly with those uh, higher institutions uh, as well as university is not only meant uh, to cater for CTRM needs but also for the entire aerospace industry in Malaysia. And the last one is on the strategic partnership. Uh, we also working with some of uh, uh, College Kemah uh, Kemahiran Tinggi Mara on some of the innovation activity. Uh, we happen to uh, try to develop some of the parts uh, that we used to purchase uh, from overseas. Uh, we worked that uh, together with KKTM and with the support uh, by EMI. EMI stands for Aerospace Malaysia Innovation Center, uh, where the technical uh, expert uh, is actually from Airbus. So, uh, and apart from this, we are also working with UTEM. Uh, this is a tripartite uh, activity between UTEM supplier industry where we have uh, actually tried uh, to turn our carbon waste uh, from shadow waste into uh, a recyclable uh, material. So this is what we're also uh, doing uh, at this moment. So this uh, page is talking about the uh, another corruption program, what we call as 2U2I. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this is the program that we have actually developed together with the RBH community, uh, which uh, took us uh, almost uh, three years to complete uh, this exercise. So the process, of course, uh, initially we kick off uh, with this discussion. Uh, we will try to relate all our experience in this composite industry uh, as part of the process in developing the syllabus. Uh, of course, uh, in 2018, we signed the MOU uh, with the RBH community. And then uh, from upon the completion of the development of the module and syllabus, we then uh, submit uh, those uh, uh, for, for it to be approved by MQA. And Alhamdulillah, we have gotten uh, the approval from MQA. And today, uh, we can proudly say that the RBH community is qualified to run uh, the Diploma in Engineering Technology of Aerospace Composite as well as the Bachelor of Engineering Technology in Aerospace Composite Manufacturing DCM. So these are the two syllabus that we have uh, developed. Other than that, uh, we also have uh, some collaboration activity with uh, JPK uh, as well as uh, MARA. So uh, this uh, is what we call as apprenticeship program. 
uh, which uh, the duration uh, is approximately 10 months, with three months on theory and seven months on non-job training uh, with CTRM. Uh, under this, uh, actually, uh, we'll focus on S, uh, SKM level two, three, and diploma. Uh, uh, diploma in aerospace composite manufacturing. So, uh, of course, uh, we also, as we are running this program, uh, they will be funded by either Yayasan Penaraju Pendidikan Mumputra or Yayasan Pelajaran Mara YPM as well as the Jabatan Pembangunan Kemahiran. Uh, so those are the funders that actually will involve. And uh, we also would like to inform everyone that uh, as at today, uh, we, have made, we have successfully completed a total of 58 batch of uh, students that have graduated uh, with a total number of of almost uh, 3,105 uh, asset today. So with that, uh, I think uh, I would like to end uh, this web uh, uh, webinar session. And uh, and with that also, I would like to open uh, the Q&A session, uh, if any, uh, to all of you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shamsuddin, with your uh, awesome sharing with us. Now we have a Q&A session. Um, so far, we have a few interesting questions from um, our viewers to our captain. We are trying our best to share all the questions today. Okay, we start with uh, Mr. Dr. Ain Lutfi Abdelatif. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. What are the biggest challenges faced by CRM? and other aerospace industry players in Malaysia in growing the industry in this country? And what are the actions taken and the requirements to address such issues? Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. I think uh, I, I will try to reply this uh, on uh, two uh, scenarios. That is uh, prior to the pre-COVID and after that, uh, we will talk about the post-COVID again. So uh, I think uh, the company, uh, uh, my company CTRM, and of, of course, uh, uh, together with uh, the Maya Malaysian Aerospace Industry Associ Association, uh, as well as the member of uh, aerospace industry, I think for the past uh, few years, uh, I think in response to the government aspiration, we have been uh, traveling extensively uh, in promoting our country uh, because knowing that uh, Southeast Asia and particularly, particularly Malaysia, is always uh, been well known as one of the most competitive uh, region in terms of cost. So, by virtue, uh, by, by using that, uh, we are actually trying to leverage our position. Uh, and of course, uh, we have been doing a lot of presentation in meeting all our clients. Uh, and we have attended many global air shows, uh, such as uh, Paris air shows, uh, Farm Bureau air shows, uh, and many, many uh, global aerospace uh, summit uh, for the past uh, two, three years. Uh, so, uh, so because, uh, as you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this industry uh, more or less uh, is, in a way, is quite settled in terms of the entry level of uh, the entrance of uh, uh, new suppliers. Uh, the reason being because... Uh, for, for the new entrants will be quite tough, quite difficult because, uh, as you know, uh, the, the 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 business is not really moving at, uh, at, at, at a very fast pace like electronic as well as uh, automotive industry in terms of the business expansion. This no doubt that uh, based on the static, statistic that I have uh, presented to you in terms of the growth rate without fail for the past 45 years, uh, 15 years for the three cycle, uh, it offers a very... Uh, promising growth, but in in reality, uh, in terms of uh, this industry itself is quite mature. The supply ecosystem uh, is actually quite settled. Uh, they have already all the players uh, in place. Uh, it's just a matter that whoever can offer the best quality, the best cost, and probably that will trigger uh, the current tier ones uh, customer or even the OEMs uh, to look into what probably the transfer of work uh, that need to be done from the current incumbent that they are in purchase uh, to the new one. So this is why uh, important that uh, in managing this business, we have to make sure that 
we always uh, maintain our position. Uh, not only uh, we have to have the best quality in place, but also we have to make sure that we have best quality. We are able to offer best quality. So I think uh, I think because of the hard work that we have done uh, for the past two years, uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, Airbus uh, has actually uh, recognized uh, CTM effort, and that is where I think you can see that in, in one of the slides, uh, CTM has able to secure in 2017-18-19 the Airbus Award for three consecutive years. So this is how we position ourselves uh, in promoting. But uh, for us to penetrate uh, the business uh, in, in, uh, by virtue that, uh, as I mentioned, the industry has quite settled down, uh, it is uh, quite difficult and very challenging. Unless until uh, we are... Uh, some of the customer is experiencing uh, some problems with their existing suppliers or some what they used to mention as mediocre supplier. So this is where actually sometimes the opportunity lies. So, and of course, uh, when you want to get into uh, this business, you must be having a uh, strong financial uh, support. Uh, I mean, strong financial background. And uh, for us, uh, I think uh, CTRM, we have been very grateful. I think uh, when government started its industry, I think the government have uh, supported a lot. And of course, uh, I think through this initiation, now uh, it become our turn uh, how uh, to continue to grow this. And of course, uh, we have done a lot of investment in terms of time, effort and money in promoting. Uh, of course, now we are waiting for uh, opportunity uh, to come. But unfortunately, when we've been uh, hit uh, by the COVID-19, uh, now probably the scenario uh, is a bit different uh, because uh, as orders has uh, reduced uh, in average more than 40%, I think uh, based on uh, last month data, that uh, in a way uh, has caused uh, the opportunity that we supposed uh, to have uh, become uh, more challenging. But we always believe that every problem lies uh, opportunity. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you notice uh, in, in my slide, uh, as many companies now, we are expecting uh, and anticipating that will face lots of problems. They might be some of them might throw their towel, uh, may decide not to continue. That uh, probably uh, something that uh, CTRM need to be on the lookout for any potential opportunity uh, for us to work very closely with our tier one customer like Spirit and Colin, as well as the OEM itself like Airbus and Boeing. Uh, for us uh, to offer uh, our, our current capacity that we deem uh, a lot uh, and to position our, ourselves as one of, uh, uh, as the number one uh, aerospace uh, industry, uh, particularly in composite uh, in this region. So this is uh, uh, the thing that uh, I want to uh, explain a bit. So there, there is still opportunity uh, for us, but it's just a matter that uh, we have uh, to await uh, a little bit. But what is important now, what we need to look is how soon the aviation industry can start uh, resuming their activities because without those activities, uh, there will be no aircraft uh, flying. And when there is no aircraft flying, then you can see that, you know, uh, there's a, there will be a lot of aircraft uh, on the ground. And of course, airliners will not be ever willing uh, to invest on the new aircraft. Uh, to purchase the, on the new aircraft. So as a result, this uh, might create uh, some uh, side effects uh, to our uh, short term, uh, probably. But in the long term, uh, I think uh, as what we have presented, uh, we are quite optimistic uh, that industry probably can still uh, recover, uh, but not as soon as within one year, probably within the next two to three years. So this is how uh, probably... Uh, uh, from my personal point of view and based on the data that we have gathered uh, and presented just now. Okay, thank you Mr. Shamsuddin. Uh, so we go to next questions from Hamizan Usman. Under lockdown scenario at USA and Europe, any business opportunity that CTRM try to venture? I think under the current situation, uh, we almost uh, can't do anything. Not only CTRM, I think for the many uh, global players. Uh, because uh, by virtue our business model uh, is involved uh, uh, in the manufacturing of components or panel of composite that to supply to all these tier ones and OEM. 
for as long as I think uh, we cannot have uh, the vaccine uh, ever ready in the market, I think uh, this uh, will be uh, quite difficult uh, for any country uh, to start opening uh, their border uh, to, to allow the air travel. So, because I think, uh, as you know, even until today, uh, there are several countries uh, is experiencing uh, the second wave, you know, uh, even like Korea and Japan, uh, even they have almost able to celebrate. And even I think uh, I came across uh, some news uh, in in China, uh, in Wuhan, uh, there, there, there are signs of the COVID-19 cases, uh, if I'm not mistaken, about 19 cases they have detected yesterday uh, throughout these few days. So it looks like the whole entire episode of, of COVID-19 at this moment uh, will never end for as long as we don't have uh, the vaccine ready uh, to be used. And, and definitely, I think no country uh, will dare to open their border uh, for air travel. And thus, this will definitely uh, will affect uh, the entire aviation industry. So for that, I think uh, in a way, at this current moment, that uh, will definitely deprive any opportunity of business because uh, even today, you know, we used to be physically uh, have hold our meeting uh, with customers face to face. You know, I think it will not be appropriate for us to have uh, or have our meeting uh, most of the time uh, online like this. Because uh, I think uh, the best is actually to see face to face. But under current circumstances, we can we can. There's nothing much we can do. But of course, uh, I think. Uh, uh, the answer to that is, uh, is is very very difficult at this moment, yeah, uh, for us uh, to have any access of any new business. Yeah, we understand that. Okay, um, so the next question is um, from Oi Chow Hong. Good morning and salam sejahtera, Mr. Shamsuddin. COVID nineteen crisis had been a huge downturn in economic activity. Many people lost their job as the companies faced financial issue. For fresh graduates and intern with no experience they are less likely to get a job during this period. Will CTRM put off recruiting fresh graduate and intern this year? Okay. Uh, thank you for the question uh, again. Uh, basically, I think our intern uh, internship program or uh, practical trainings or internship program will still continue. I think uh, as a Malaysian, uh, I think uh, knowing our roots, uh, where this company came from, I think it has, it has always been uh, our obligation to ensure that uh, we are able to provide uh, the training platform or, or on-job training as well as the practical training for all the students. But of course, in terms of uh, opening opportunity for job, uh, that will be a different subject matter entirely. Because at this moment, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, of course, uh, the whole entire CTI management, I think prior to the COVID, we are working very hard uh, in expanding our business. In fact, uh, we have already built uh, the six factory. Uh, if you can see the, from the slide that I have presented earlier, uh, I think uh, last year we have spent 100, uh, almost close to 140 million. Uh, but of course, uh, now the factory is still empty because uh, the idea is actually to house uh, uh, any potential new business that probably uh, we managed to secure. So that is our new a building which is entirely empty at this moment. So we have been working uh, hard uh, in ensuring that we're able to secure business in order to create a new job employment. Because you can see that our revenue grows for the for the several years, for the past uh, several years has been growing, if not uh, much, but at least not less uh, than 5% year on year basis. However, I think due to the COVID-19, uh, we have to change our approach uh, and strategy. But of course, uh, for the training uh, at, uh, for, for the student attachment for practical training, interns and whatnot, I think uh, that uh, we can still continue and uh, and we will support uh, on that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Shamsuddin. Okay, the next question from Nia Ahmad Ridwan. How do you develop your managerial and leadership skills? What quality of leadership is required under such a big and global company like CTRM? Uh, First, firstly, I think uh, I, I have to say that uh, I have to thank the Almighty 
Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. I think uh, I started with the right footing. Uh, of course, uh, when I finished UTM uh, in 1988, uh, I think our country uh, still in recession. Uh, there's not much of job available uh, to offer, uh, especially for us, the JPA student. Uh, we just uh, grab whatever that we can secure at that particular moment. And of course, uh, I started uh, my career with a Japanese company. Uh, I served uh, the Japanese company like JVC for 11 years. I think that uh, in a way has uh, able uh, to uh, mold me uh, uh, and to prepare me uh, for the future to what I am today. Uh, I think uh, Japanese institution is is still the best, okay, institution because uh, it is uh, apart, it is being very regimented. Uh, it demands uh, you to be more disciplined uh, uh, in terms of uh, your work activity uh, and execution. And of course, it stress a lot on time management because this is where I think uh, many of us uh, sometimes we take uh, such a thing uh, for granted. But when we, when uh, and and I also I think uh, apart from the Japanese, I also had uh, the exposure in working with the Americans uh, in Western Digital as well. So the combination of this, the brand of this, uh, has in a way helped me uh, uh, to be exposed on the different. Uh, style of management and of course I also would like to thank to many of my bosses which I, I cannot mention uh, uh, them one by one because there are many of them uh, in the list uh, uh, they have been actually uh, the one who has been instrumental uh, in providing many guidance uh, coaches as well as uh, support to me uh, uh, during my the process of uh, 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 developing my managerial skill uh, throughout the many years uh, in my career. And of course, uh, there are risks associated to this, you know, as you move along. Uh, because uh, I'm not sure whether anybody uh, that I knew uh, since throughout the 30 years, I can see that most of them usually uh, have to experience or have to face many challenges before they can be what they are. Uh, or before they can be very successful. I'm not saying that I've been already a successful man. There are many things uh, that every day is a learning process for me. Uh, moving into one factory to another, this is the eighth assignment uh, throughout my 30 years. I'm still learning every day and even today. So, but uh, what is important is uh, actually uh, we must have uh, the good determination and readiness uh, to, to go through the process of what we call learn, unlearn and relearn. Uh, so this is important. So for as long as we have that and we we are able to persevere and we have the determination and of course uh, the value that we must uh, inculcate to us is the value of sincerity, honesty and of course uh, at the same time as a Muslim I think uh, we, 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 we should not neglect uh, our religion uh, what uh, is actually a demand uh, from us. Uh, so I think with that uh, I think uh, and the more important is our ability to raise to the requirement on, and the expectation of the challenges. Uh, this is important. So if we have all the quality and desire, uh, and I think uh, we should be able to pull through. Uh, I think this is uh, one of the things that uh, what has been uh, the principle has been uh, uh, I, I hold until today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shamsuddin. Okay, this is the last question from our viewer, Mr. Kanan Paramal. Let's say the pandemic ends in December. How long do you think it will take for CTRM to recover the lag time? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you, you know that uh, currently the vaccine is being developed and there are 200, 200 over countries has been infected by this. And, you know, I think... Uh, we, Malaysia being the small country, we have to compete with a big country like US and Europe uh, who is more at the forefront and they have the money power uh, to actually involve with the research and development of this vaccine. And as you know, uh, I, do not, I do not want to criticize so much because we are online now. But I think, uh, of course, uh, I believe uh, it will be very difficult uh, for us for as long as we don't have vaccine uh, ready in the market and uh, the country, uh, those countries that have, uh, uh, that start to subscribe to this vaccine for their citizens. I think uh, many countries
this uh, will have uh, the fear uh, to allow uh, uh, visitors uh, to come into their country. So probably even so, uh, they will allow. They will be. They will will have to go through many restriction, many filtering, many screenings. So this is uh, the process that we need to go through. So the traveling uh, will not be that easy. So as such, I think even uh, uh, assuming that uh, by end of the year uh, the the vaccine is been made available, what is important is people desire to travel uh, because how they going to overcome the fear and sentiment. Uh, of this COVID-19 probably will take uh, some time. And looking at that, uh, probably I think it will take another between uh, one and a half years to three years uh, probably uh, to see the real recovery. But even I think uh, even uh, there are many people, uh, analysts has been talked about this. Even we can see that probably the, 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 the recovery momentum will be there. But to expect uh, uh, our situation to be as uh, to, to achieve to the level of the pre-COVID-19 uh, will still take time. Will still take time. So probably we can see a gradual uh, recovery, but will not be able to reach uh, the situation where we were before uh, prior to the COVID-19 outbreak. So this is what. Uh, uh, so, but for CTRM, I think for as long as uh, we can manage to uh, secure uh, our revenue around. Uh, probably around 600 to 700 million uh, that uh, should be uh, able to allow us to sustain uh, 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 in the next, uh, uh, in the many, many years to come. Yeah. So, of course, uh, if we can surpass 1 billion, that is a remarkable achievement because this is what uh, I and my team is looking forward uh, because our responsibility is not only just to continue what the business that we have to do, but our obligation and responsibility is to expand the business in order to be able to uh, accommodate more and more employment uh, for the country and for the uh, for and for the graduate, so this is uh, the spirit that we have uh, today. Okay, thank you, thank you again, Mr. Shamsuddin, for your good and inspiring sharing with us. Despite of your busy schedule, so you are giving your precious time with us. We believe it would benefit to our students, our staff, alumni, and our community as well. And inshallah, we will overcome this uh, tough time um, during uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, uh, with that, I would pass to Yamra Sahad, um, Dr. Rafiq, for your last word for our session today. Okay. So, uh, my last word uh, to all the... Um, uh, thank you, uh, Murni. Uh, Mr. Chamsuddin, thank you. Thank you so very much for sharing your experience as a CEO leading CTRM and various other companies. We are extremely, extremely proud to have our own alumni leading such an important industry. By the way, you mentioned a couple of companies that you have worked with previously, PHN and OSI. Those are uh, metal stamping companies. Yeah, just to yeah. mention that uh, my first job after I graduated back in the year 1999, was uh, Sextan Technologies uh, which is also a metal stamping company. I still remember those 600 tons equipment, you know, that makes uh, lots and lots of noises in the factory. Uh, yeah. Thank you again, uh, uh, Mr. Sham, for your willingness to join our Faculty of Engineering Captains of Industry. I really enjoyed looking at all your slides, very nice pictures of various types of aircrafts. Uh, and uh, finally, thank you to all our viewers. I would like to ask all of you joining our session right now to like, comment, and share our Facebook. Uh, yes? Like, comment, and share our Facebook because we have many more Captains of Industry CEOs webinar series for this month. And uh, we have another webinar uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. So uh, don't forget to tune in, like, comment, and share our Facebook. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Murni. Uh Okay, thank you, Marissa Dato, and also uh, thank you, Mr. Sham, for your time with us. And also, thank you so much for our viewers today. It is always a pleasure for us uh, for having our large number of viewers for our webinar, Capture of Industry, today. Please wait to our upcoming webinar with our next Capture of Industry and surely with interesting issues. Please don't forget to like, comment, and share our program. With that, I would like to uh, last but not least, Wabilahi Taufiq Wahidaya. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Salam Ramadan dan selamat berbuka puasa. Have a nice day. Bye.